All right, with this lecture, we continue in our quest for having a more theoretical analysis of hash functions. And what this slide is about is the term reductions. Now, you might have heard the term reductions, for instance, in uh, stupid, uh, stupid jokes about mathematicians, such as like reduced to a previously solved problem or reduced to a previously unsolved problem. Um, for instance, like there's a mathematician who noticed the fire in the garbage bin in the corner of his office. And then, so the mathematician gets up, takes some water, extinguishes the fire in the garbage bin in the corner of his office, and goes back to work. A few days later, he notices that there's a fire in the garbage bin under his desk. So he gets up, takes the garbage bin from under his desk, puts it in the corner of his office, and goes back to work. Because he solved it to a previously solved problem, or reduced it to a previously solved problem. Not expecting you to laugh, but just saying you might have heard these jokes before, and this is exactly the meaning of reduction that this slide is about. Except for now, instead of trying to entertain you with um, jokes about mathematicians, even if they're not particularly good, and we can find a whole web page with I don't know how many variations of this thing, which also analyzes mathematicians compared to computer scientists compared to engineers. Um, if you have too much time, you can find these things on the internet. For now, let's focus on complexity theory reductions. Well, actually, it's the computer scientists to blame in this case, not the mathematicians. So, a reduction reduces or takes an algorithm for one problem and turns it into an algorithm for another problem. So, in particular, if we have two problems, say problem one and two, and we have an algorithm for problem one, then we can with a reduction, turn it into an algorithm for problem two. If that's the case, then the statement is it reduces problem two to problem one. So it takes the thing that we're now solving and reduces it to the one that we knew how to solve before. So sometimes, well, it is, when you read it like this, it's fully intuitive. But sometimes when students end up writing it down in homework or whatever or exercises, this direction gets flipped. So if we can use an algorithm for problem one to solve problem two, then we reduce problem two to problem one. The mathematician has reduced the problem of extinguishing the fire in the garbage bin under his desk to extinguishing the fire in the garbage bin in the corner of his office. So the reason that we're interested in this is that it allows us to relate the hardness of some problems. And for hash functions, we have now seen complete hardnesses, but also already with the discrete log problem, position Diffie Hammer problem, computation Diffie Hammer problem, we have looked at relations between the hardness of the problem. And if we have an efficient reduction, because that's also a reduction is another algorithm, uh, and you typically need to do something to turn problem two into problem one, and you have an algorithm that's sufficient for solving problem one, then you can do the chain of those two things to solve problem two. So what we have seen already is if you can solve the discrete log problem, then you can solve the computation of the problem and the decision of the power problem. So to practice the notions from here, we can reduce CDHP and DDHP to DLP. So we can solve these two by solving the discrete log problem. And also we have seen that if you can solve the computation of the Hammer problem, you can solve the decision of the Hammer problem. These are sort of the uninteresting directions because these are obvious. These are just here to introduce the notation or to make it more familiar. So DDHP reduces to CDHP. And now, since this is a lecture in the hash function um, segment, we of course want to look at how the security properties of hash functions play out. Um, there are some caveats. For instance, the reduction need not imply that the probabilities of success are equal. So, for the examples you've seen so far, well, if you can solve the DLP with 50% probability, you definitely also get the CDHP and the DDHP with the same probability. There might be better algorithms for solving problem two. Sure, problem two is no harder than the other one. It might be easier. 
the, the implication is only one direction. Um, it also might require, not in these cases, but in some other cases, which we'll see, that you have to solve problem one multiple times. So the reduction might say, okay, well, I now have an addition algorithm for problem one, so I invoke it five times. That is a constant number of time, and so we still consider such things tight. But if you need to invoke it something which is related to the input length, say n, and you have to invoke it n times, or logarithm of n times, then we call these arguments non-tight or less tight. And so we want to relate the security of one problem to the security of the other problem. And what we like to do in, in security, well, it's called security proofs of security approval security, is we relate these problems. We relate the security of some complicated system. You design a new protocol which is somewhere deep inside using some math assumption, and you want to relate it to this math assumption. Because the math assumption is nice, clean, abstract, and you can study it, or you say, well, people have studied this math assumption, people have studied discrete logs before, and then you want to, and now watch out, you want to reduce the hard assumption, the thing that you assume is not solvable, that mathematicians have studied, to the problem of breaking it with the system. So basically the other way around is up here. We would like to reduce DLP to the computation diffeyer or the decision diffeyer problem in order to prove that those things are hard because people have looked at the DLP. Now in that lecture on the security notions I actually said that in many groups you can relate those in those directions for the CDHP and the DLP. So there for some groups, the DLP reduces to the CDHP, but for bigger problems that might be, or for bigger protocols that might be an issue. And so we would like to put this rule as a as a contradiction or as a proof by contradiction. So assume, and now your problem one is your new full crypto system, assume that there is an efficient algorithm for solving or for breaking the new full crypto system. Then if there is a reduction a mathematically hard problem to well, problem one, which is your cool crypto system, that means you could use an attack on your cool crypto system to break that math assumption. Well, we all believe that this math assumption is secure. Nobody could do this. That implies that the assumption that there exists such an attack on the crypto system doesn't hold. So that means your crypto system is secure. So you need to have Hard math assumption reduces to the crypto system that you're working with. Now it's not an absolute proof, it's just a reduction, it's just relating the securities. So we still don't have a proof that the math problem is actually hard. Well, people have studied it, but they might have missed something, or maybe it is hard now, but it's not hard at the quantum computer. So proof of security does not prove security as an absolute um, security term, but it relates the security of some new system to the security of a well-studied, hopefully correctly assumed to be hard problem. Okay, after all of this um, talking about security proofs or approval reductions, let's jump right in. Now, we have looked at some hash function properties, particularly I've seen SPR and CR, and this slide is just repeating the definitions. And again, I'm going to do one of those proofs in the easy direction. And you can't actually go in the other direction in this case. Um, so we want to show that if a function is collision resistant, then it's also second reaction resistant. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, first of all, this means CR reduces to SPR. So if you would have an efficient algorithm against SPR, it would also get you CR. If we assume that CR is well, function is position resistant, then it is also secondary pretty much resistant. Now to prove this, um, we want to take an algorithm that, well we want to build an algorithm to attack collision resistance. 
And I'm now using subscripts on the A to indicate what it is attacking. So you want to build an attack against collision resistance using an attack against second Brion resistance. So we're assuming that we have an efficient algorithm ASPR against SPR, and you want to build an efficient algorithm from that for collision resistance. So we now have an algorithm that we can just ask, well, we have to give it bell input like up here. So we have to give it a K and an X, and then it will output an X prime with these conditions. And now if we assume that the algorithm works, that means that its probability is not negligible. So it means that we have a good chance that this is working. Well, that it outputs something and that it satisfies the properties. Okay, so for collision resistance, we have to satisfy this one. So we're first giving a K. Well, obviously this is the same K that we'll also give to the SPR attack. And then the SPR attack also wants to have an X. Well, we can just pick randomly some X. Then we say, well, please find us a second free image that matches this X. And then the SPR algorithm, well, takes this K and this X. So we now have a valid K, we have a valid X, just pick this one, and then outputs an X prime, it says here, with a condition that like, maps to the same hash value and that it is not equal to the input. And then, well, our algorithm for rate collision resistance gets this k, does these steps here internally, so it does one call, let's say it does it asks ASPR for an answer, and then it outputs basically the same answer we got from ASPR, it also outputs x. Now, if ASPR was successful, then also our new algorithm ACR is successful. So it has the same runtime modulo. Well, we have to do one random picking. We might want to invest some time in order to test those things. Um, but the important part is the call to ASPR. So whatever ASPR takes in time is essentially the part that ACR takes. And if ASPR was successful, ACR is successful. Now, there are many ways it could fail, for instance. Well, the ASPR might give the wrong answer, but also it can't work if there does exist a second image. So, well, we talk about much, much larger input spaces than the output space, but it's still possible that we have picked some X which maps somewhere which only has one incoming edge. It can't be that there is no incoming edge because, well, we pick the X. It's not that we pick a Y down here. We pick an X, which definitely maps into the into the output space. And then the question is, is there another X prime that has this? Um, of course, we can make our algorithm ACR nicer. We can allow it to iterate. We can allow it to sample another time. So if it uh, if it has picked an X where the ASPR was like, sorry, can't do, then we can up our probability, we can improve our probability by just running ASPR with another input. And now that we're looking at the, uh, the updated definition of hash functions, where the input space doesn't have infinite length, but has some finite length, L of n, well, if L of n is much, much larger than n, then we have a pretty good chance that an element that is input actually has, well, sorry, that an element, which is in the output space, has more than one input. Now, the exact numbers depend on the ratio between those, but we have a good chance, else we just iterate a second time or third time. So, if a function is collision resistant, yeah, yeah if it's collision resistant, so CR reduces to SPR. If we would have an SPR attack, we would also CR attack. So if CR is not breakable, then SPR is also not breakable. So reduces to takes the property which we assume is unbreakable and reduces to another one that we want to relate to it and then says, well, okay, this one 
that price reduction between those, so also this new assumption is hard. In this case, well, we know that SPR is O of 2 to the n, CR is only O of 2 to the n over 2, so this reduction is not particularly interesting, but it illustrates how they work in general. And as a final one, I want to look into more reductions. Not saying I can get it, but for instance, we have these other properties, we have pre and we have SPR. And then the question is, does SPR reduce to pre? So here's an attempt at pre. We could use our add. Remember, assuming we have an attack on this side, and we want to build an attack on this one. So assuming we have an efficient algorithm to break pre matrices, then we want to build an algorithm to break second pre matrices. So we come in, and these are our inputs. So we're given these. We have to satisfy that anybody who gives us a k in x, then we can run our new algorithm, which is allowed to call a pre, um, and then we're supposed to output an x prime. Now what does a pre do? A pre looks very similar here, here. Oh, but then the h, um, we first have to compute the y, and then the a algorithm is getting k comma y. Well, okay, so we just do it the favor. We take this x that we received, we compute the y, so we compute this value here. Now we have a valid input for pre, and well, since we picked the x, uh, sorry, since we were given the x, we computed the, the second input, the h of k comma x, we know it's a valid y, so it's the output of some value. And so whatever probability a pre has to run, this is a valid input we would output correctly with this probability. So that will give us an x prime such that x prime or the hash of k comma x prime is 1. Now, does this break pre matrices? Is this all the attack? Well, it's like most link. I've written x prime, but well, we can only hope that x prime is not equal to x. It's very easy to test, but there is no guarantee. It just says I'm gonna find your pre image. Well, we all know one pre image, we know x and it might just output that very same x. It doesn't have like a, an evil uh, opportunity to do that because it doesn't know what x was. All it gets is the y, all it gets is the hash output. But we might still get unlucky and have it output the same x that we put in. Well, there are actually some cases where we definitely get unlucky, for instance, if h is an injective function. So, for that to work, we need to have that the input space is no larger than the output space. And also typically injective functions would be kind of weak on the other hand, while you could have a random computation um, where it's still hard to find pre images. So it's not impossible to have a hash function which is injective. It is not the normal case that we look at. But if it's injective, there's only one x. So there's no chance the probability that this algorithm works against second pre image resistance is zero. So it doesn't inherit the probability of the A pre. Of course, if A pre doesn't even work, our ASPR that we're building from it also won't work. But A pre can be a perfect 100% correct and 100% working algorithm here, and we still totally fail if H is injected. Now, if the input space is L of n, is much, much larger than n, so we have actually a compression, then we have a pretty good chance that some output value y has more than one input, so it does have a second pre image. And maybe it has a third pre image, fourth pre image, and so on. Now, if we have such an x, such that the image of x under k and h has at least two uh, different pre images, well, then there's a 50-50 chance, or somewhat better if there are more of the pre-images, that the output of a pre will be different from the x that we had. 
So if the outbox space is larger, we have at least a 50% chance. And of course, we then can run it again, depending on how A3 works. It might always output the same, or it might output the other one. But since it doesn't know which one our input was, averaging over all the random choices of x, you would get a 50% or better chance that it works. Now the exact numbers of how successful this is, how often you need to run this, that depends on the ratio of the length of the input over the length of the output. Now there's a second way of bootstrapping for this. For instance, you might still want to have some relation between these properties, even if your hash function is not compressing, or even if it's expanding, like the output space is longer than your input space. In that case, um, if you have a algorithm that decides whether some value has a second pre image, then we can also, well, win this one. So we then might decide to just not ask for certain x. So then we just fail for certain x, and for the other x, we ask. So those things are then possibilities to improve. So if we decide, oh, this was a bad x, then we just fail, we don't call the algorithm at all. If it has a second pre image, well, we bet on it, we hope that it gets lucky, so we have at least a 50% chance of getting a different one, and then we run that. So this is how um, SPR and pre are related. So it's not an easy relation, it's not a 100% one is easier than the other, if we can solve this, we can solve that kind of relationship, but there is a relationship with some probabilities. So that's not tight, and it depends on the output space and the input space, or well, the size of the output. That's as far as I go on the theory. We'll have another lecture on hash functions coming up, where I show some form of construction, where also the construction is again having some principal reduction.